On the 30th of May, 1921, 19-year-old Dick Rowland, who worked down the street from the Drexel building in Tulsa, Oklahoma, USA, went there to use the restroom. Tulsa was a segregated city, and so Dick uh, Rowland had to walk down the street to the Drexel building in order to use the bathroom. On getting to the building, he needed to take an elevator to reach the colored restroom on the third floor. Unfortunately for him, 17-year-old Sarah Page, a white girl, was already inside the elevator. How did such a simple thing as stepping into an elevator explode into a life-shattering world event that we now acknowledge as the destruction of the Black Wall Street. Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Please sustain this channel by turning on your subscription and notification buttons if you've not. Thank you. Although it has been reported that Dick Rowland had a short time to attend to the call of nature and get back to work on that fateful day, it is impossible to know what was going on in his mind as he stepped into that um, elevator. Knowing it was dangerous for a young black man like himself to be alone with a white woman. However, in the world of Tulsa, Oklahoma of 1921, not a lot of things were easy to explain. First, 1921 was only about 56 years after the United States abolished slavery. As such, the Greenwood District of Tulsa, o o Oklahoma, was almost an anomaly because it had grown into an astonishingly prosperous neighborhood. At that time, in other parts of America, black people were being forced to live under very harsh conditions. In places like the South and Midwest, the sharecropping uh, system continued to keep black people under the same uh, conditions um, that they were during slavery. They continued to toil on land owned by their former white masters, uh, white owners, at the end of which they had to surrender the largest chunks of their crops to the white landlords, who also found various ways of keeping them trapped in debt. The black people who were determined to improve their lots did so facing the constant threat of violence, lynching. It is uncanny how, if you pause to think about it, the same system of finding ways to keep black people indebted after slavery uh, was officially abolished is eerily similar to what has been used, you know, in Africa and the Caribbean since the so-called end of colonization. African countries are independent in name only while we continue to toil to repay loans on uh, loans that were forced on us, or why we continue to engage in economic practices that were designed solely for the enrichment of so-called developed world. Our indebtedness will not be paid for generations to come and until we decide to free ourselves from the shackles of indebtedness and so-called globalization, we will remain impoverished. 
if we do not free ourselves. What we are doing, in essence, is allowing ourselves and generations to come to remain colonized, enslaved. But that's a topic for another day. In 1921, the population of Greenwood was made up of black people who had migrated there from the south in search of better conditions of living, which was elusive to them um, in the south. Some of the black people who settled in, in Greenwood, in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, were veterans from World War I. And they were people who were eager to start new lives in the country that they had helped to defend. Before most of them settled in, in, in the area north of the city of Greenwood, they had tried to settle in Langston, also in um, Oklahoma. But they were driven out of Langston by racist white people. From Langston... They landed in Tulsa, and in spite of the strict Jim Crow segregation laws of the city, and despite only constituting about 12% of the population of Tulsa, black people in Greenwood succeeded in establishing a vibrant and prosperous district. At the time, the state of Oklahoma, and Tulsa in particular, was quite prosperous due to the growing oil industry that allowed most of the people of the town to grow rich. But being rich meant they needed to hire black people from nearby Greenwood to work not only as domestics, but in other capacities needed by the booming economy of Tulsa. These economic activities allowed the black people to invest in their communities and start their own businesses. Some historians like James Hershey have pointed out how opulent life was in the black, uh, for the black people of Greenwood, who lived, because they lived in well-built uh, brick houses that were sometimes furnished with Louis XIV furniture, fine china, and Steinway pianos. They established their own newspapers, cafes, stores, theaters, hotels, and professional offices. This district soon became known as the Black Wall Street. Some even called it Little Africa. They were not allowed downtown, but they had carved out this district, which must have aroused the envy of the white populations who did not welcome them downtown, except when they were there for work, and who, as we now know, were only waiting for an excuse to destroy them. So, what happened in the elevator at the Drexel building that day when the Coroland stepped into it. Well, it's hard to say. Some observers say that the elevator was actually faulty and that it never stopped on the third floor as the girl who said she was assaulted claimed. Others speculate that the Crowland might have tripped and in an attempt to prevent a fall stepped on the girl's toe. Some even believe that the two young people, Roland and the girl, knew each other and that whatever happened between them in the elevator could simply have been a tiff between two young people. Whatever it was, Sarah Page, the young white girl that was in the elevator with Dick Roland, reported to the police that he assaulted her and news about the assault spread like wildfire, gaining momentum in much the same way as fire. 
Rumors saying that someone saw Dick Roland running out of the elevator grew wings. And others said the girl, uh, the girl's dress was ripped. Others still went further to say that she was ripped. By the following day, jungle justice was fully in motion. The Crowland, who had been arrested, was taken by a mob of armed, angry white men to the courthouse. There was no doubt that their intention, the intention of the mob, was to lynch him. However, they reckoned without the community in Greenwood. The community turned up to protect the young man. It has been estimated that about 75 men, some of whom were trained World War I combat veterans, turned up to protect him. Unfortunately, they must have underestimated the hatred which the white community had against them because of their success. Before you knew it, someone in the white mob had fired a gun and the black people had to retreat when other shots followed. They were forced to retreat, and, but they went back to Greenwood to secure their community. The white vigilantes saw this as an opportunity to lay siege on the black community. The community was soon overwhelmed because the white vigilantes, who were better armed, quickly outnumbered them. Also, heavily armed, angry white mobs from neighboring cities, as well as the police, joined these uh, white attackers. These animals in human skin, as Fela Nicola Pupiti, might describe creatures who hunt others for enjoyment, put up a machine gun and directed it into a church where they knew people had gone to take refuge. Some rode around the city in cars, firing through, uh, through windows of houses. They went into homes and dragged men out to shoot on the streets or dragged them tied to the back of cars around for display through the city. They went on a rampage like the stampeding cows that they were, smashing windows and kicking in doors to loot jewelry, furs, and other valuables. They even brought in airplanes that flew menacingly over the black community, shooting down dynamite at buildings, destroying homes and workplaces, shops, and even funeral homes. They continued this frenzied spree of destruction until the next afternoon when the Oklahoma National Guard arrived and proclaimed martial law. Unfortunately, it was too late for the thousands of black people who had now become homeless as a result of the wanton destruction of lives and property. Hundreds of black people lost their lives, with millions lost as a result, uh, millions of dollars also lost as a result of the carnage. To add salt to injury, the National uh, Guard chose to believe the police who lied that there had been a Negro uprising. <laughs> 6,000 Greenwood residents were arrested and detained for a week. Upon release, with nowhere else to go, many were forced to join the rest of the homeless, living in a Red Cross tents. Can you imagine the physical, psychological, and emotional torture of people who had been living in the kind of comfort that these black people had carved out for themselves only to end up as homeless? Can you imagine 
what life must have been like for them during the winter of 1921 and others that followed because they were forced to live in makeshift tents as homeless people. Not only was Greenwood rendered uninhabitable, all effort to rebuild it was, res was resisted. Instead, there were attempts to relocate the residents far away, but they resisted, and many tried to take the case to court. They didn't want to be moved from, you know, a place where they had built. Over a hundred suits were filed. A hundred lawsuits were filed. However, the judicial system failed them. A sham grand jury, which was set up to investigate the incident, ended up blaming the black people for inciting race riots while exonerating the white people. Unsurprisingly, the white girl who started it all did not even show up to testify against the Crowland in court. Thankfully, he survived and the case against him was dropped. Unfortunately, those who tried to rebuild their, this remarkable community found their progress slowed down by lack of access um, to funds and the new zoning, zoning laws which were put into place to stop them from redeveloping. Even those who had insured their homes and properties were ripped off by insurance companies who claimed that their policies did not cover riots. So this is how one of the most vibrant uh, and, uh, African American communities was raised to the ground. Thank you for watching. Please continue to share your comments and questions with us. Also, please give us a thumbs up and share our videos with your contacts. See you next time.